Tarzan of the Apes, brought to you from out the pages of Edgar Rice Burroughs' thrilling book. Tarzan watches the result of his terrifying call of warning. He sees Sheeta's glossy form slink behind the cover of a spreading mimosa bush. Then turns his head to find Clayton staring up at him in utter amazement. Tarzan regards the young Englishman curiously. Gracefully poised on the tip of a swaying limb, the ape man watches the color flood back into Clayton's face. The jungle, which had momentarily stilled at Tarzan's warning cry, stirs again to life. From the solid mass of tall trees comes the shrill piping of jungle birds, intermittently broken by the deeper notes of the larger birds. Half hidden by the dense verdure, Manu the monkey chatters and scolds. The high sun, filtering through the lacy maze of vivid green, floods the clearing with splashes of gold. Tarzan's bronze body melts into the shadows. With the ease and skill born of years of habit, he drops limb by limb, branch to branch, behind the dense screen of tropic leaves, and lands on the moss deadened ground behind Clayton. The Englishman wheels around, reaches for his rifle, and stops when he sees Tarzan. Thanks, old so man. You certainly saved my life. Tarzan says nothing. Curiously, he examines Clayton's clothing. He runs his hand over the woolly texture of the khaki hunting shirt. Clayton turns to face the ape man. Tarzan grips him by the shoulder, spins him around. Into Clayton's mind flashes the memory of the warning note pinned to the door of the hut. You must see Tarzan of the ape. Tarzan pays no attention. Now he's examining Clayton's boots. I do. I say, I don't we talk? By way of answer, Tarzan pulls Clayton's right foot from under him and continues his minute examination of the strange white man's leather feet. Clayton struggles to regain his balance. Look here, old chap. Don't you think this has gone far enough? Tarzan lets Clayton's foot go. He reaches for the rifle, but Clayton's too quick. The Englishman tries to get his hand over the trigger guard. Tarzan grips barrel and stock. He twists. Clayton winces, his fingers caught in the guard. They sway from side to side. Tarzan raises his arms above his head. Clayton hangs by his fingers to the trigger guard. He can't hang on. His fingers slip, slip between the trigger and guard. He tries to draw them clear. He can't. Meanwhile, back at the hut, Jane, her father, and Philander discuss Clayton's prolonged absence. I completely fail to comprehend why a practical man like Clayton does not return. Oh, do you suppose anything could have happened to him? Almost anything might happen in this... Wilderness? Don't worry, Jane. I'm sure Cecil is perfectly capable of taking care of himself. Uh, yes, yes, of course he is. Dear, dear me, so many things have happened. I, I've hardly had time to write a line in my notebook. Uh, dear, dear me, I had built such high hopes of finding the treasure in order that it might defray my archaeological research cost. Oh, did it ever occur to you, Daddy, that perhaps there might not be any treasure, that it all might be a hoax? Oh, dear, what has happened to the test? Oh, tut, tut, Jane, I'm perfectly convinced by internal evidences deduced by me from the map... Well, might it have been a forgery? Yes, yes, perhaps. Uh, to be perfectly fair in my judgment, it might have been a forgery... However, I feel that such an eventuality is remotely negligible. Well, have you thought that there might be a duplicate map of the treasure location? Duplicate map? Why, yes. I've read in books about pirates that it sometimes happens that one of the crew makes a map for himself unknown to the captain. Then he can come back and steal the treasure for himself later. Oh, dear, I wonder where it's happening. Well, really, really, most interesting, my dear. I must admit that the possibility of such a thing had escaped me. Perhaps. Yes, it is quite a possibility. But uh, I fear it is too much to hope. I fear the mutineers have absconded with our treasure and are probably even now dissipating the proceeds. Oh, it's not a treasure we should be worrying about now, Daddy. It's Cecil. It seems hardly likely that he would have stayed away as long as this. Uh, you're right, my dear. Uh, then, as you suggested... We had better prosecute a search. Professor, hadn't I better remain with Jane? Why, certainly not. Case? Nothing will harm me. And then we will proceed at once. Come, Philander. If Cecil returns while you are gone, I will fire one shot. That will be the signal for you to come back. Splendid idea. Uh, why, yes. One shot. Re remember, Philander, one shot. 
I shan't forget. Now keep within sight of the cabin. Oh, but, my dear, if we keep within sight of the cabin, it will seriously impair the efficiency of the search. Well, be very, very careful then. We shall be careful. Well, come, Philanga. Let us enter the primeval fastness. Uh, here, here, now, now, please, please point that rifle either at the ground or at the sky. You leave, Professor. Have no fear, I've handled rifles before. Oh, do be careful. Yes, yes, my dear. Does it not appear reasonable to you, my dear Philander, that in any sort of serious research work... Look, Professor, there's a broken branch. That means Clayton has passed this way. Again, my dear Philander, you are indulging in that most mentally debilitating habit against which I have so frequently warned you. That of jumping hastily at conclusions. The process of reasoning... Quite so, Professor. But I read in, in some book, rather, I can't recall at this moment the title that the aborigines of these regions unerringly read such science in the forest. But I might call your attention to a faulty major premise, Mr. Philander. You are not an aborigine. And ah, our friends in the treetop evidently agree with my scientific conclusions. Apropos, I believe we're out of sight of the cabin. And Jane said... Uh, right, right. Jane did say for us to remain within sight of the cabin. But might she not have meant hearing rather than sight? I wonder. Since an acoustic rather than a visual signal was arranged. She's not, Professor. There's a mimosa branch broken at just the height of a man's hand. I am sure Clayton passed here. Uh, mm, 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 most interesting... I must make a note, sir. Let us press forward a piece, Professor. We may yet overtake, please. Ah, yes, 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 yes. The mimosa, when crushed, gives off a pungent odor. Uh, would you describe the odor as pungent, Philander? Or should I say... Oh, say whatever you please. But hurry! We must find Cecil. Uh, one moment, one moment, Philander. Do not be so precipitous, uh, so, uh, precipitous, I say. Pungent odor, yes. I would describe it as pungent, and in that con connection, I might also mention that the female of a certain species of fruit fly... Bless me! So, what was that? Rifle shot! Clayton must have got back! Come, Professor! Come on, let's be sorry! Come on! Hurry! Hurry! Back in the hut, Jane hears the shot. She thinks of Clayton, or, or, or her father may have fired it, and goes to the door. Oh, no, stops her in her tracks. Before the hut stands, sable the lioness. Jane leaps back into the hut and slams the door. With anxious, fumbling fingers, she drops the locking bar into place. With a snarl of rage, sable leaps. Her heavy body crashes against the barrier. Jane stands behind the door, trembling. The lioness scratches at the rough planking between her and her prey. Sniffing and growling, she circles the hut. She stops, looks at the barred window. She raises herself on her hind legs. Four paws on the sill, she glares through the window. Sabor sees Jane watching at the end of the hut. The wicked eyes gleam. The long, brutal claws work convulsively. She tests the bars with her huge paw. She drops to the ground, gathers her haunches under her, crouching. With a roar, she hurls herself upward. She crashes against the wooden bars. They creak under the terrific impact. They hold. Sabor strips back to the ground. She makes to the door. Hurls herself forward again with terrific force. The door holds. Sabor again eyes the window with its slim bars. She screams! The bars snap! Sabor's huge paw slips through the opening. Another bar snaps and another! And the brute closes its eyes, forces its great tawny head through the window. Jane looks at the brutish head trained in the window. Desperation seizes her. She steps back. She sees a revolver lying on the bunk. She snatches it, throws the weapon up, and throws the trigger. Who is this Sabor in the shoulder? With a mingled roar of rage and pain, the lion has to the ground. She crouches. Scream! She carries the roof halfway through the window. Frantically, Jane presses the trigger again and again. Again and again, the hammer snaps down on the empty sh